auspicious greetings and welcome to the Buddhism in the Sea of Islands webinar series. I'm Jue Wei, Director of the Humanistic Buddhism Centre in Nantian Institute, Australia. As is the beautiful custom of Australia, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Darawal people as traditional custodians of the land on which Nantian Institute resides. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all are and pay my respects to the Indigenous elders past and present. Over the past year, the Humanistic Buddhism Centre has worked closely with Deakin University and Western Sydney University to present this webinar series to you. We are also grateful to the Xingyun Education Foundation for its generous support. Together, we have formed a growing Buddhism in the Pacific worldwide network of scholars, some of whom are here today with us. Our research network aims to bring together scholars from different religions, disciplines, and institutions to initiate dialogues and collaborations around the study of Buddhism in the Pacific. We are compiling articles from scholars in the network for a special issue in the Journal of Global Buddhism. All our papers trace a network of flows of Buddhism across Oceania and Hawaii. This webinar series allows us to share our research ideas. Each webinar since June runs every third Thursday of the month through to October 2021. Buddhism in the Sea of Islands kicked off from Australia with Anna Halaforth and a team presenting us a glimpse into Buddhism in Northern Australia in the post-World War II years. And then in July, our team at NTI shared our research looking at the flow of innovations across the Fo Guangshan network of temples in Australia and New Zealand. Last month, we crossed the Pacific Ocean together with Venerable Karma Lakshi Somo and looked at Buddhism in Hawaii. Today, we'll stay in Hawaii for just a little longer with Dr. Helen Baroni. The speaker will give a presentation for about 45 minutes, followed by Q&A. First, a few words to introduce Professor Helen J. Baroni. She's a professor of religion at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, specializing in the religions of Japan, Buddhism in North America, and new religious movements. Her current research focuses on Zen in Hawaii, especially the development of Honolulu Diamond Sangha. She authored Love Roshi, Correspondence between Robert Bach Baker Aitken and his distant correspondence in 2012, Iron Eyes, The Life and Teachings of the Obaku Zen Master, Tetsugen Joko in 2006, and Obaku Zen, The Emergence of a Third Sect of Zen in Tokugawa, Japan in 2000. Professor Baroni, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Greetings from Honolulu. Let me share my screen. All right. So I'll be speaking tonight uh, about a topic that's closely related to my current research project. At the moment, I'm writing a biography of Robert Baker Aitken, who is the founder of Diamond Sangha um, and here locally Honolulu Diamond Sangha. And it's going to include a history of the first decades of the movement as well. I've worked with Diamond Sangha for the last 18 years in various capacities. Um, Robert Aitken initially invited me to be the humanities scholar on a few grants that we wrote together for the Hawaii Council for the Humanities uh, to bring his archive to the University of Hawaii. Um, and my working relationship has gone from there. Uh, earlier in my career, as you could hear, um, my research centered on Japanese Zen, specifically Obakushu, um, in early modern Tokugawa, Japan. So here's an outline of what I'm planning to cover tonight. Um, there are no historical accounts yet written about Diamond Sangha at all. And so um, 
A large part of the work I did for this paper was to hammer out a part of its history that I had not yet written for the biography. Um, at the same time that I was trying to analyze for patterns that I could see in the data as they emerged. Whoops, sorry about that. So Diamond Sangha was founded by Robert and Ann Aitken, pictured here in their living room, uh, which was the first zendo in Diamond Sangha. Um, they founded it in 1959 as a living room sangha. Living room sangha is a term that I use for any small practice group that meets in someone's home or in a rental property um, without the benefit of a resident teacher. Many, many Zen groups throughout the United States were founded in this way, and I believe also in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so Diamond Sangha grew from these very, very humble beginnings to what is now an international network of Zen centers um, that stretches across the Pacific from Hawaii East to the continental United States, um, from Hawaii Southwest to Australia and New Zealand um, and Southeast to Chile and Argentina. Um, there's also at least one group still in Europe, in Germany. Diamond Sangha descends from the Harada Yasutani lineage, um, which is a combination of sorts of Rinzai and Soto practice styles of Zen. Um, it is better known as Sambo Kyodan, although lately I've seen online that they call themselves Sambo Zen, um, a, a little bit friendlier, I guess, for pronouncing. The title for my talk was inspired by something that Aiken once wrote to his teacher, Yamada Kouun, about his vision for what Diamond Sangha would eventually be. He used the term Indra's net, which as many of you are aware, derives from Vedic religion. The deity Indra is described as having a wondrous jeweled net across decorating, adorning his palace. Uh, at each intersection of the net, there is a gemstone and each gem perfectly reflects all the other gems on the net. So that if we look at one of the jewels, it can be seen as the central node, any of them. And at the same time, if we zoom out, it can be seen as one among many. In Aitken's vision for Diamond Sangha, I would argue what he intended was for each individual practice community to be unique, each one serving the needs of its particular place and culture, while simultaneously united in a larger community, the Mahasanga, held together by a common sense of tradition that they shared as their binding force. Diamond Sangha contributed to the rapid growth of Zen across the Pacific region beyond what one would expect of a very small little practice group. Um, here on Oahu, the largest it ever got to be was perhaps 90 to 100 people. Um, and for most of its existence, far, far smaller than that. Uh, it accomplished this by using a horizontal networking style in which low, um, visiting teachers, fully qualified Zen teachers, would visit and nurture small local sanghas elsewhere and, and foster, train, the local leadership until those individuals were able to lead their own groups in their own right. Aiken's vision for Diamond Sangha was a blend of innovation and tradition both, balancing the need, balancing the need to serve local communities in culturally appropriate ways, while with the imperative that he felt very strongly to preserve the inherited Zen tradition of his Japanese teachers. The research that I've done for this paper is based on ongoing archival work that I've been doing for several years. Um, it includes items like journals, such as the one you see here. This is the journal that he kept while he was in, um, interned as a, as a POW, a civilian POW during World War II in Japan. Uh, it includes thousands and thousands of letters like this one that he wrote to his teacher. 
um, as well as items like um, meeting notes and newsletters, and it goes on and on. Um, all of these are housed as part of the Aitken Papers at the University of Hawaii's Research Library. I also sub supplemented this material um, with some interviews with two Diamond Sangha teachers for this paper, uh, Nelson Foster, who was Aiken's primary Dharma heir, he now teaches in California, and Michael Kieran, who is the local teacher here in Hawaii, here in Honolulu, um, he is Nelson's Dharma heir. Um, also, I, I've added a little bit of what I've learned through participant observation with the group over the years. So by way of giving you some context for this, I wanna talk about Hawaii from three related perspectives, starting with demographics. So as Karma Lecce said last time, Honolulu, whoops, Honolulu or Hawaii, is, excuse me, is a remarkably diverse place. Um, and you can see from this data, which was from the 1960 census, the first one, um, for which Hawaii was a state in the US. Um, so at the time, about a third Japanese American, about a third European American, only 16% Native Hawaiian and so on. Um, in comparison to the larger United States, it is extremely diverse. Um, this is data for the, main, for the continental United States from that same um, census. And you can see uh, how very different that looks. Uh, for most research purposes, when doing a study of anything in the United States at all, um, Hawaii can safely be ignored. Uh, we are less than 1%, less, less than one half of 1% of the US population. And so most of the time, it's so prohibitively expensive to do work here uh, that we are ignored. But when studying American Buddhism, Hawaii holds a very, very special place. It is unlike other parts of the country. Hawaii has long been a transportation hub for trans-Pacific trade, travel, and cultural exchange. Um, first by outrigger canoe that the Polynesian, the ancestors of the Hawaiian people uh, used to travel all around the Pacific um, and to arrive here. Uh, then later by, by ocean liner, um, people stopped here in Hawaii on, on trips between uh, the United States and all over the Pacific, um, and more recently by air. Now, I'm actually old enough that I remember that the first time I flew to Australia to visit family there, I had to do a quick stopover in Hawaii to get, to get there. Uh, we were flying from New York. And the first time I went to Japan on a research trip, we had to stop in Hawaii. Well, Robert Aiken made good use of, of just that fact. Um, and for Diamond Sangha's advantage, he invited teachers from Japan that he knew to stop in Hawaii for a bit longer so that his group would have access to fully, fully qualified Japanese Zen teachers for guidance of the group. Um, Lastly, to say a few words about Buddhism in Hawaii. Uh, although Hawaii is politically part of the United States and Buddhism in Hawaii is often treated as a part of North American or American Buddhism, I, I really wanna stress that Hawaii is neither geographically nor culturally North America. Uh, I'm not sitting in North America as I speak. And if we subsume Hawaii's Buddhism, under the rubric of American Buddhism or North American Buddhism, what we end up doing is erasing the one part of the country in which Buddhism is a deeply integrated part of the local social fabric. So since the late 19th century, a fairly large portion of the local population um, has actually self-identified as Buddhist. Um, these are various um, surveys that were taken over the decades. Um, the data shown here is all very problematic. Just so you know, in nearly every one of these surveys, 
approximately 40% of the individuals surveyed refused to identify any religious tradition at all, and for good reason um, in many cases. Uh, and I have to also mention that they only included Hawaiian religion, the indigenous religious tradition of the Hawaiian Islands, uh, starting in 1971, which was the first time that researchers from the University of Hawaii began collecting the data. So the first Buddhists to arrive in Hawaii were almost certainly Chinese merchants um, who began arriving actually in the 18th, in the late 18th century. Uh, most Chinese emigrated to Hawaii uh, in the latter half of the 19th century. That's when most of our Chinese population arrived. Um, and most of them came as single men who were planning to work on the sugar plantations. Uh, most of these men, they would typically marry a local Hawaiian woman and start their families after that. Um, the picture on the left shows one such family uh, on the island we call Big Island, Hawaii Island, um, in the, uh, sometime in the 1890s. Uh, the image on the right, I wanted to include something from today. Um, this is the only, the only exclusively Buddhist Chinese temple of that I know of um, that, that has been working on, still open um, in Honolulu. There are probably others that I don't know about, but this one um, is open to the public and is exclusive. Most of the other temples do other kinds of practices. This one, the Guanyin Temple in Honolulu is exclusively Buddhist. The Japanese started arriving a little bit later than the Chinese had. Um, the first group came in 1868. Um, the largest numbers came after the year 1885. Um, Japanese actually emigrated often as family, small family units. Um, when single men, when single Japanese men did arrive in the islands, they tended to write home to their families to see if they could arrange for a picture bride, what were called picture brides. They would exchange images and the man would pay passage for the woman to arrive and they would marry at the docks. Um, they also wrote home, the early Japanese community did, to ask Buddhist temples at home to please send priests um, to serve their ritual needs. And the first missionaries arrived um, from the Honganji, from the Jodo Shinshu sect. Um, they first arrived in 1889, and this is the very first mission that was set up in Hilo, that's also on the Big Island, um, that same year. In the contemporary period, Buddhist temples of all sorts uh, function as ordinary parts of religious life in the islands. Um, there are many temples on each island, all over the islands. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of the way things work here, Obon, which is the Japanese version of Ulumbana, um, typically ce celebrated uh, in Japan in July, August, here in Hawaii is celebrated all summer long. Because what the Japanese temples do here, the Japanese, all of the Japanese Buddhist temples, they divide up the weekends from the middle of May through August, in pre-pandemic time at least, um, so that everyone gets to host a weekend of dance. And so local people can go and dance together whenever they would like all summer long. Uh, and I promise you that the people who attend are by no means all Buddhist. Um, anyway. So my paper is caught covering just one very tiny little piece uh, of Hawaiian, of Buddhism in Hawaii. Uh, and now I'd like to shift our attention to Aiken himself and his early encounters with Buddhism and then Zen specifically. So the picture on the right is of a young Robin Aiken, as he was then called, um, he was about seven when this picture was taken. He moved to the islands when he was four or five years old and was raised here. Um, he did not encounter Zen in Hawaii. It existed, but he, he didn't encounter it. Um, as a youngster, a couple of years after this picture would have been taken, he did get a bicycle and he used to tell me stories about riding around town. And one of his favorite places to go is a museum called, it used to be called, the Academy of Arts. And in that museum is this beautiful image on the left of Guanyin. 
And there's a bench right in front of it so that the viewer can sit and view the image. And as a very young child, he was just drawn to this image and he would sit there and contemplate it, even though he had no idea who Guan Yin was. Um, and he would joke that that was his first connection with Buddhism, was with this beautiful image. He first encountered Zen much later when he was a POW, a civilian POW uh, in Kobe, Japan. Uh, he was held there from 1942 until 1945. Um, he was picked up by the Japanese on the island of Guam, where he was working as a civilian contract laborer for the U.S. military. Um, the image on the left um, is one of the camps. He was in three separate camps. And I, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'm, I'm, I'm circling. That's Bob Aitken, 24 years old when he was picked up. Um, he was picked up on Guam in December 1941. Um, Guam was bombed the same day as Pearl Harbor, uh, and uh, he was put on a boat with all of the um, civilian and military enemy aliens and shipped to Japan where they spent the war. Um, he, he encountered Zen while in the POW camp. Um, by reading a book called Zen in English Literature and Oriental Classics by R.H. Blythe, who's pictured also on the screen. Um, he said that he, after he got the book, he read it about 10 times over and over and over again, he would read it. Um, and Blythe himself, as Aitken knew, was a British citizen, also in Japan, and also being held at a different camp as a civilian POW. Um, and in spring of 1944, all of the camps were put together. The civilian camps were put together uh, for safety in the hills above Kobe. Um, and so Aiken and Blythe were together in the same place. And for the last year of the war, he was able to study with Blythe as his teacher. So he does count him as one of his Zen teachers. Uh, this introduction to Zen was largely literary. Um, Aitken was mostly writing Zen poetry, um, Zen style poetry in Japanese and in English. Um, he was studying Japanese language, uh, learning some Chinese characters, um, and reading every book that Blythe had in his extensive library, which he had with him um, while being held as an intern um, about Buddhism. So he read as much as he could. Um, the experience of the war had a, a very deep deep uh, impact on Aitken. Uh, by the end of the war, he had vowed to himself two things, that he would someday practice Zen when he was able, first, and second, that he was going to work in some way for world peace. Uh, in June 1945, toward the end of the war, he and the other POWs with him watched as the city of Kobe was firebombed and it burned to the ground and a million people lost their homes that day. Um, and he, he, they watched as the survivors straggled up the hillside where they were safe, um, also looking for safety. And so that's when he took those two vows. His first experience actually practicing Zen, practicing med Zazen meditation, um, was with Senzaki Nyogen in Los Angeles in California. Uh, he moved to LA in 1947 specifically so that he could practice with Senzaki Sensei. Um, Senzaki was a Rinzai monk, Rinzai Zen monk, who arrived in the United States in 1905. And he kept, uh, a he made a promise to his teacher he would not teach for 20 years. He began teaching in 1925. Um, more than 20 years later, when Aiken met him, he was leading a small group in East LA um, and Aiken moved nearby in order to join the group and practice with him. Now, this style of practice that he did with Senzaki, um, Senzaki had westernized it. He had made it comfortable for uh, Americans not of Japanese descent. Um, they sat in chairs, much as I am sitting now when they sat Zazen. They, 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 didn't, they didn't sit um, in normals and postures. Um, but later when 
Aiken spent a study year in Japan, uh, he was able to spend the better part of a year practicing in the far more rigorous setting of monastic uh, Zen monasteries in Japan. Uh, pictured here is the monastery Ryutakuji in Mishima, Japan, uh, where he spent the longest period of time during that research year. Uh, and that's where he met his next Japanese Zen teacher, Nakagawa Soen. So now, finally, I'm going to get to Diamond Sangha itself and talk about its development and eventual network growth. So Diamond Sangha went through several stages of development over the early decades of its existence. For the first 10 years, it functioned on the island of Oahu um, in Honolulu as a living room Sangha. They had visiting teachers who came annually from Japan, and they also had resident advisors, uh, people who were not fully qualified Zen teachers, but who were allowed to help guide the meditation practice that um, the lay members of Diamond Sangha uh, undertook. In 1969, after 10 years of, of Diamond Sangha's existence, Bob and Ann Aitken, his wife, moved to the island of Maui uh, with Seki Dukatsky, who was then their resident advisor, and they established on Maui, Maui Zendo. And they established it as a residential Zen center. Um, it housed about 12 people, including the Aitkins and um, Mr. Sekida, uh, and uh, functioned then as a residential practice place. But on Oahu, the earlier Kokowan Zendo continued to function as a living room Zendo at the same time. Later, when Yamada Kowun became the visiting teacher for the group, um, then under his guidance, Diamond Sangha became a Sambo Kyodan affiliate group officially. And then in 1974, when Aiken was appointed as an independent Zen teacher in his own right, then a local Hawaii network, Diamond Sangha network, developed. And Aiken served as the resident teacher. He moved from center to center um, for periods of time. Okay, am I in the right place? Yes. All right, as Diamond Sangha developed, its role in the transmission of Zen changed um, through the years. Initially, it served primarily as a conduit for Japanese teachers to spread Zen to Americans in the continental United States. Um, teachers would visit, as I said, annually, they would lead intensive practice periods called seshin um, during their visits. And then they would go on to tour um, various cities on the continental US. Once Aiken became a teacher and he was able to serve the local network, um, there were four groups eventually, one on each of the four major islands. Um, and after that, not long after that, he became a visiting teacher himself. And he started going to serve distant groups um, both on the continental US, um, places that invited him to come and lead Seshin, much the way Diamond Sangha had invited the Japanese teachers to lead Seshin. Um, and he also traveled to Australia and New Zealand. Um, for example, he traveled to Australia annually from 1979 until 1988, when he was ready to pass those groups on um, to someone else um, who was already a Dharma heir. Um, by the late 1980s, Aiken had moved back to Oahu from Maui, um, and the international network that was Pacific wide developed while he was here in Honolulu, and they called the local group Honolulu Diamond Sangha. Um, so, as I said earlier, it stretches from the western region of the United States mainland to Latin America and to Australia and New Zealand. And now I have some pictures just to give you an idea of what it looked like um, during these stages. 
Um, during the period when it was a conduit for Japanese teachers, the first teacher was Nakagawa Soen, the person he practiced with at Ryu Takuji. Um, and these two images, um, the one on the left is Soen doing calligraphy. Uh, that was taken at Kokowan here in, uh, in Honolulu uh, in about 1961. Um, and on his last visit to Maui, I, I think the date is 1978, um, he visited Maui Zendo as well. And in this image, um, this is Nakagawa Soen sitting next to Bob Aitken and Ann Aitken here. Um, I don't recognize any of the people in the group. Um, I may well know some of them, but I know them as people in their 60s and 70s, and I don't recognize any of these young people. Okay. Um, in 1962, when Nakagawa Soen stepped back from teaching for several years, he asked his friend Yasutani Hakuun to take over for him. And Yasutani began visiting Hawaii annually from 1962 until 1969. Um, so here you see him with the Kokowan group on Oahu with Bob and Ann Aitken in the back row. Um, and this image is also Kokowan. This is the, the altar with, with Yasutani's picture on it um, after he had died in 1973. Now, relying on visiting teachers creates some inherent instabilities for a group. Um, they were dependent on these visiting teachers. And the first disruption happened um, in 1962 when Nakagawa Soen decided that he couldn't teach any longer. Uh, his own teacher died. Um, his teacher had been like a father to him, uh, Genpo Roshi. And his mother then died just a few months later. So he lost both his Zen teacher and his mother within a few months of each other. Um, and at this point, he stepped back from teaching. Um, and Honolulu, Diamond Sangha was for a period of time um, feeling in, in the lurch. They, they didn't have anyone to come, um, although they did have a resident advisor that Nakagawa had sent uh, in 1960 he had allowed Edo Shimano to, to come. Um, Shimano was a monk from Ryutakuji. Um, he was not yet qualified fully as a teacher, um, but he was allowed to lead certain aspects of Zen practice. Um, he was their first resident advisor. Um, the second much more serious disruption was precipitated by Edo Shimano's misconduct in 1964. Uh, that's at least when Aitken found out about it. Whoopsie. Um, so I want to say a few words about this circumstance. It almost destroyed Diamond Sangha. Um, it is the topic of two full chapters so far of the biography that I'm writing, and I know it's going to keep coming up. Um, so it's far too complex for me to go into in any detail tonight. But but I do want to mention that Nakagoa, uh, that... Um, what the disruption looked like. Um, so Nakagawa had sent Shimano to be their assistant um, and he had been with them for four years uh, before they found out that he was actually a sexual predator. Um, he exploited two women who were part of Diamond Sangha, uh, one very young, only 18 years old, the other one a little bit older. Um, both of these women experienced serious emotional breakdowns in the spring of 1964, just within weeks of each other. And both of them were hospitalized here in Honolulu as a result. Um, Aiken volunteered at the hospital where they were on the psychiatric ward uh, because he was very concerned uh, about what was happening. And while he was volunteering there, he learned from the medical staff that Shimano's behavior had directly impacted these two women's illness. Um, one of the doctors, both of the doctors actually wrote letters um, verifying this for him. And he flew to Japan in order to seek advice from his teachers, Nakagawa Soen and Yasutani Hakuun. Um, he denounced Shimano to them as a predator. And he expected, he hoped that his teachers would call Shimano back to Japan for some kind of disciplinary action. 
Unfortunately, he was disappointed. Um, they instead blamed the women, they blamed the victims, uh, and they sided with Shimano. And they didn't offer Aitken any support in dealing with the situation. He flew back to Honolulu and Shimano was furious with him, absolutely furious, um, refused to see him, packed his bags uh, and left the island almost immediately for New York, where he soon um, had, had situated himself um, as the teacher at the New York Zen Studies Society. So meanwhile, back in Honolulu, um, Aiken originally intended to denounce him to immigration authorities. That was his plan. Uh, and he did have the letters, copies of the letters from the doctors. But his wife, Anne, discouraged him from doing that. She was very concerned about what the impact would be on the two women. And she asked him to remain silent. Um, and so he did. Um, one of the women, the 18-year-old, actually lived with them off and on. She was in and out of the psychiatric ward, ward for years, and, and actually for the rest of her life. Um, but for five years, she lived off and on with the Aikens. And Anne felt that if they went public with it, uh, that this would be very harmful to that particular young woman. Uh, and so he decided he would remain silent. Um, he understood that if he had denounced Shimano, Shimano would have been deported. Uh, he was the, the visa sponsor that was required at that time. All Asians had to have a visa sponsor for long-term uh, visas in the United States. Um, and uh, he would have been deported. Aiken understood that his teachers would have cut him off and Diamond Sangha would have lost any contact with the Japanese Zen community. Um, so by his silence, he was protecting both the women and the Diamond Sangha community. Um, but it was at great cost, although I don't think he could have had any idea how many people Shimano would hurt over the decades. Um, his relationship with Nakagawa Soen and Yastani were permanently damaged. Um, he never made any more progress in his practice working with them. His trust had been completely undermined. Um, and he and Anne regretted their silence for the rest of their lives. Um, she talked about it um, right before she died. Um, and in the last couple of years of his life, in, in 2008, Aiken opened up, unsealed a part of his archive that had previously been sealed and was intended to be sealed for 25 years. Um, he allowed it to be opened and he shared it and it was published online. So if anybody wants to see it, it's there. But in Honolulu, the members of the Diamond Sangha had no idea why Shimano had, Shimano had left. Shimano had told his story to some of these members um, and uh, the, the group fractured into two. Um, supporters of Shimano left the group um, and the rift um, destabilized the group for a period of time. Fortunately though, um, Nakagawa Soen sent another, this is the only image of Seki Dakatsuki I could find. Um, and when he came, he was an old man. Um, and this is clearly a much younger person, but um, Seki Dakatsuki was sent by Nakagawa Soen in 1965. And he served the community here for, for several years until 1971. And the group did stabilize again under his very calm, quiet leadership. In 1971, um, Yasutani retired and stopped visiting in 1969. In 71, um, Yamada Koun agreed to begin visiting as the visiting teacher. He was the Dharma heir of, of Yasutani. And when he started visiting, everything changed for Diamond Sangha because he treated both Bob Aitken and Diamond Sangha completely differently than the other teachers had. Um, he did not visit Hawaii as a stopover on his way to primary sites on the US mainland. Uh, instead, um, this was where he was primarily visiting. Um, this was the group he was serving. And he took Aitken seriously as a potential local leader. And he put him on a fast track, as it were, to become a teacher in his own right. Um, Yamada thought that Diamond Sangha was a well-established Zen community, and he invited them to become an affiliate 
of Sambokyodon. With that status, people started coming to Hawaii as a destination, actually, to practice, especially after 1974, when Aiken um, became a teacher. Um, they remain an affiliate of Sambo Kyodan until 1995. So over 20 years uh, after Yamada had died, they had what Aiken called an amiable divorce. Um, the two groups parted company and uh, Diamond Sangha no longer calls itself a Sambo Kyodan group. So under Yamada's guidance, Aiken became first an apprentice teacher and then an independent teacher um, in 1974. And in this capacity, he began to lead three communities across the Hawaiian Islands. Kokowan, the original group, um, this, was the, uh, that, this is what Kokowan looked like. Um, that's the house in Manoa. Um, this is the second Maui Zendo. Um, it's not the one I don't think that um, is called Maui Zendo now on Maui, and a very short-lived group called Buddha Mountain Zendo on Kauai. Um, it was part of a hippie camp, Taylor Camp, um, which was a group of tree houses where young people were living, and the Zendo was in the downstairs of one of the tree houses. Um, that group didn't last very long, uh, but in any case, uh, Diamond Sangha continued to grow and eventually, Aiken, as Dharma heir, uh, was able to build the international network. Uh, the map that you see here, and I can't see the Latin American groups because of the images of people. I'm going to move mine over so I can point it. Well, anyway, um, there were the four groups in 1993 when they started to try to formalize the network. There were four groups across the Hawaiian Islands, the four main islands. Uh, there were six groups on the continent of the United States, four of them in California, basically. Um, there were three in Argentina and Chile, one in Chile. And there were five groups then in Australia. Uh, none of the New Zealand groups were yet affiliate groups. I, I think some of them already maybe existed um, but in 93, none of them were on the official list of affiliate groups. Um, so this is what the network looked like in 93. It, it, there's more now, um, but uh, I thought I would go with the list that I had from 1993 when the process of formalizing the network started. Okay, so now I wanna talk about Aitken's vision for Diamond Sangha. Um, it included elements that we might call both modernist and traditionalist, if we use the terms the way Bauman did in his work. Um, on the one hand, Diamond Sangha stresses lay practice rather than monastic practice. Yamada was not an ordained, uh, an ordained monastic. Aitken was never ordained, nor are well, one of his Dharma heirs is now, but none of them were originally, none of the early Dharma heirs were. Um, so the focus is on lay practice and lay leadership as well. Uh, the focus is on meditation. In Japan, Sambo Kyodan is a very modernist looking group because it is lay focused and focused on lay people practicing meditation. Um, uh, Diamond Sangha looks a little bit different, as, as you'll see. It, it has more traditional elements, in fact. Um, but what Diamond Sangha does have, that Sambo Kyodan does not have, um, is democratic governance. All of the Sanghas within the movement um, use some form of democratic governance. Most of the groups use a form of decision-making by consensus. Um, which Aiken actually learned from Quaker practice. Um, he practiced with the Quakers for a period of time, never became a Quaker, but he worked with them. On the traditionalist side, Diamond Sangha strives to preserve the, the tradition, the Japanese Zen tradition that Aiken inherited from his teachers, particularly from Yamada. Um, Diamond Sangha also emphasizes ritual practice far more than any of his Japanese teachers ever did. 
Um, and so I'm going to show uh, two two quotations from him um, that show the modernist uh, and traditionalist side. Mostly it shows the traditionalist side, actually. Him pushing back in two directions on people to preserve a, a tradition. First of all, he had to push back on his students um, because they wanted to, to modernize and as they called it back then, westernize very quickly. So he wrote to one student, if Zen Buddhism is not transplanted intact pretty much, it cannot take root. It will accommodate itself in time. The lilac is a bush in New Zealand and a small tree in Hawaii. But if you start chopping it in the process of transplanting, it will just up and die. Don't be in such a blasted hurry. I can definitely hear his voice saying, don't be in such a blasted hurry. Um, this person did, I don't think stayed within the group and did, did start a group that um, modernized much more quickly than Diamond Sangha did. On the other hand, oh, it won't let me, it won't let me move forward. There we go. On the other hand, he pushed back on his teachers asking for more ritual, more religion. Um, he wrote to Yamada, we need more religion in our practice. Otherwise, Zen is merely some kind of humanist practice, a kind of self-improvement exercise. I want people to really feel that they are disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, he felt very strongly that, especially in the US, um, but later he would write similar things to Australia and New Zealand. Um, he felt very strongly that uh, Americans needed more ritual so that they could experience Zen as a religion, as the full package. Uh, as it were. And so Diamond Sangha uh, does have ritual practice that is not typical even of the parent group, Sambo Kyodan. So all of Zen is in one sense, inherently vertical as a tradition. It passes from teacher to teacher, from generation to generation. The lineages are vertical. Um, and so Aiken's vision for Diamond Sangha included this, this vertical lineage of teachers that would preserve the tradition. And in his mind, it was up to the teachers primarily to do that. Um, within Diamond Sangha, teachers are expected to make decisions in matters related to practice. All other decisions should be made by consensus and dem democratically, um, but they make the final decisions for mm. matters of practice. Um, at, at least in his vision. Um, and so he entrusted to his Dharma heirs, other Diamond Sangha teachers, um, to preserve this tradition. Um, and also he gave them the task that collectively they were going to establish what he called common ground that would hold Diamond Sangha together horizontally. So the idea is teachers would be creating this lineage, this vertical link, and they would establish the common ground that will hold the horizontal network together as well. The horizontal network would respect local diversity and local culture as much as possible. Um, so, and are governed by consensus. Um, and we do see that this worked extremely well, this horizontal aspect. Um, the respect for diversity across the network has worked quite well over the decades. Um, and I've got two examples that I want to share quickly. Um, first, Mountains and Rivers Session, which are basically hiking session. They started at Ring of Bone in California in 1978. Gary Schneider, who was the leader then, uh, led the first Mountains and Rivers Session. Uh, it has become a tradition to go twice a year, once in spring and once in summer. So I highlighted the two backpacking session here. Um, and this practice then spread from the periphery. I, I remember, Jue, wasn't it you who was talking about um, traditions that could start um, in, in, in the network, but not at the, not at the headquarters? Well, this started not at the headquarters and came back to headquarters. So in Hawaii, mountains and rivers session have gone on for decades. Um, here in Hawaii, they are called Helen Maui. 
um, that's Hawaiian for peaceful walking. Um, this is the picture from this, this just this last May uh, when a group of nine Sangha members went over, they practiced, they were hiking, um, getting in shape for months um, because most of them are in their 60s and 70s now. And um, they went over to Big Island and they backpacked through Volcano National Park um, for Hele Miley 2021. Um, it exists also in Australia and New Zealand. I am told that it is sometimes called wilderness session there. But when I looked online, what I saw was Sydney Zen Center saying rivers and mountains session. Um, so it's all over Diamond Sangha, all over the network. But I have also seen rivers and mountains hiking uh, session for non-Diamond Sangha groups, at least in the United States. Um, so this is caught on very widely. My other example started in Australia, and these are exclusively women's session um, that started, as far as I know, at Sydney Zen Center. Uh, I've not, not been able to visit any of the groups in Australia. I just came off sabbatical this past spring, um, but obviously because of the pandemic, I stayed in Hawaii, and so I haven't had a chance. But anyway, um, this practice, as far as I know, has never come to Hawaii, never come, come home as it would come to, to the, the Honolulu Diamond Sangha. Um, we haven't had a teacher here of a woman. There are lots of women teachers in Diamond Sangha. We haven't had any in Honolulu until just this year. Um, just this year, Michael Kieran uh, appointed a new Dharma guide. That's what they're calling apprentice teachers. Um, she's a friend of mine, Kathy Ratliff. Um, has just been named. And so perhaps women's session will catch on here in Hawaii as well, um, now that Kathy is a teacher. Um, okay, so now my conclusions. Um, there have been a lot of challenges in balancing the traditionalist versus the modernist tendencies in the group. Um, and the balance didn't turn out quite the way Aiken probably wanted it to come out. Um, his vision for a formal agreement that would lay out on paper and everybody would sign of the common ground that everybody agreed to across the network, it never fully materialized. I've got documents that circulated for years, but none of them were ever finalized precisely because so many challenges emerged in the process of building consensus, negotiating towards consensus. The first challenge is with coming to consensus, even in one's home sangha. Um, Aiken really believed in consensus. He, he really did, but he struggled. I, I'm not sure how self-conscious he was of the struggle. His students were aware of the struggle. Um, I had a long conversation with Nelson Foster about this. And uh, on Maui and in Honolulu, when they would be working toward building consensus, they had a process. And sometimes the group was going in a direction and Aiken wanted something else. And he never said it out loud, but he always communicated it non-verbally and they would pick up on it. He would sigh, his body language would change. They could feel his disapproval and one by one they would defer to their teacher who they loved. And so that isn't really what consensus meant um, in teacher circle with his Dharma heirs, he encountered similar sorts of problems. When they were trying to work out a, an agreement about certain practices they were gonna have, they didn't always agree. And Aiken, they didn't reach consensus and Aiken was left with a decision. Am I gonna make a unilateral pronouncement as the founding teacher, or am I gonna let the disagreement stand? And most of the time he let the disagreement stand. So diversity began even where he didn't want it on the practice level, because he didn't like making top-down decisions for his Dharma heirs. Um, when specifically working to form the network agreement on common ground, they encountered even more trouble because his Dharma heirs were completely unwilling to represent and negotiate for their sanghas. 
their idea was, we'll talk about it together as teachers, we'll go home to our sanghas and we'll come to a consensus there. And next year we'll come back and we'll see what, but it's too awkward. You can't build consensus across the Pacific over years and years. It's just too awkward. And so in the end, establishing common ground was, it fell by the wayside. It, it never actually happened um, in any formal way. Aiken had written once uh, to his teacher, worthy traditions will be established in a hundred years and unworthy ones will have died out. He believed that, and that's what he fell back on when building this kind of common ground consensus failed. Um, in the end, he had to trust his Dharma heirs. So the Dharma heirs affirm their lineage back to Aiken as the founding teachers, and all the local sanghas are allowed to evolve with Aiken now gone, trusting that eventually any problematic practices will die out and only good will survive. Uh, this solution, I would say, exemplifies a kind of postmodernist pattern that celebrates difference, diversity, and hybridity. Um, that's a quote from Gleig uh, across the network. So if you look, the balance between tradition um, and, uh, and change modernist change, postmodernist change, I think it's postmodernist change, um, in the balance, diversity, difference, and hybridity have, 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 are heavier in the balance, um, to, to use a, a, an expression from Islam. So I'm going to stop there, and I thank you very much for all your patience with me. Thank you, Helen, for such an insightful and interesting presentation on the journey of um, the Honolulu Diamond Sangha into a trans-Pacific Zen network and also modeling it on the Indra's net. What an innovation. So since my area of research is around acculturation and Fo Guang Shan also believes in balancing tradition and innovation, I can identify with many of the challenges that you so articulately recognized as you spoke. I can also identify with Hawaii as a trans-Pacific hub because when I first flew to America to study in 1983, I had to stop over at Honolulu to get to Ann Arbor, yeah. Michigan. And I cannot believe that was almost 40 years ago. I know. So listening to the life of um, Loshi Robert Aitken, it seems to also confirm to me that great people are made through difficulties in their earlier years mm. and also insistence on their beliefs through time as they develop their sanghas. And yes, I'll definitely check out this rivers and mountain sessions in Sydney. <laughs> Thanks for introducing it. May I now invite participants to indicate either via the chat or through raise hands if you have a question or comment. And in case I miss anyone, I'll call upon Xiaoyang to please unmute and let me know too. Does anybody have a question for Helen or just comment? There is a question from Michelle Barker. Ah, Michelle with... Are you able to mute and ask, or would you like me to, um, to say it on your behalf? Michelle, are you able to unmute? She's saying- Okay, ask back. for you. Okay, so, so Helen, how many Diamond Sangha teacher and groups are there now? And Michelle wants to thank you for such a wonderful talk. Thank you, mahalo. Um, I didn't show my last slide that said mahalo nui loa, which is the way we say thank you very much in Hawaii. Um, I don't know exactly how many. Um, they no longer, there are maybe 30 um, centers listed on the Honolulu Diamond Sangha list um, with links, some of them with links, some of them without. Um, I think there are more groups that aren't listed, and I, I don't know what the current number is. Um, 18 and 93, there were certainly at least another 10 in formation at that point. Um, and I don't, I haven't gotten that far. Actually, my research is going to stop probably um, in 2010 um, at the end of Roshi's life. 
Okay, while waiting for the next question to come through, I'm just curious to find out, is Diamond Sangha a conduit of all schools of Japanese Zen teachers or is it of a particular sectarian group such as it, maybe, yeah, the Rinzai school? The early teachers like Nakagawa Soen and Senzaki uh, Nyogen, uh, they were Rinzai teachers. So, so Aiken started with Rinzai practice, which uses koan. Um, but Sambo Kyodan, uh, he, he started working with a Sambo Kyodan teacher with Yasutani. And Yasutani was, was a Soto monk who incorporated aspects of Rinzai practice. So Sambo Kyodan practice is this hybrid, um, it's a modernist group that was founded um, in the 40, 50s, maybe 1950s. Um, and it's a hybrid because it combines Rinzai and Soto styles. Mm. Um, so if you, so they practice, they use koan mm -hmm. uh, in their practice, for example, but when they sit zazen, they face the wall, which is Soto style. So yes. they, they, the practice looks Rinzai in one way and it looks Soto <laughs> in another. Um, so um, Diamond Sangha is, is, of that kind of hybrid style that's typical of Sambo Kyodan still. Yeah, so quite hybrid. I see yeah. a raised hand from Damika. So can I invite Damika to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, um, first uh, let me uh, thank her for a wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, I found that uh, there's I can uh, statement say that uh, I want people really to feel that they are the disciples of Sakyamuni Buddha. How far it has been achieved in in your region or in your community, uh, whether uh, the even the, between the uh, your sangha, diamond sangha, or the followers. Are they really uh, focusing into this area or it has been uh, diversified in different segments like just, just doing practices and uh, other things? Diamond Sangha holds true, the local group holds very true to um, Robert Aiken's style. Um, now, when I visited with the group, not all members um, when I, I've had discussions with members who say it is not a religion at all. For them, it is not a religion at all. Um, they don't like the word religion, so it's not a religion. For them, they'll say it's a spirituality uh, because they like that word. Um, yeah. uh, do they think of themselves as disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha? The, uh, the, the very firm, the, the core group of members that I know well certainly do. Um, it really shapes their lives. Okay, thank you. Alan, there's a question from Jane. So Jane, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, hi, um, I just wanted to first start by thank, thank you for that really interesting talk. Um, I don't know anything about the Diamond Saga, so it's very enlightening. And I also just wanted to sh thank you for sharing those experiences of the two survivors of sexual misconduct. Um, and I really look forward to reading the bi biography, um, not just for the whole journey, but also for those two pieces. I think you delivered and presented them very with, with much poignancy and sensitivity. Um, but I was also wondering, because you mentioned that um, those resources were available online or the I think the archives are all available online. And I was just wondering the link if you have a link for that, if you can share it. Only I, I don't I didn't come with it. Um, if you if you if you Google Edo Shimano, um, if you Google his name, and I probably could find the link um, rather quickly. Um, there is an Edo Shimano archive online. It's the only part of the Aiken archive that is available online. Um, just that, and it's and not all of it comes from Aiken. There's lots of material there, all related to. Edo Shimano, um, because he went on, I mean, he was a predator over decades, um, for decades and decades. Um, but, and the material looks like archival material. Have you ever looked in an archive? You will be looking at letters 
um, and they don't necessarily fit into a context. Um, so the work I've been doing is piecing together a history from those, those letters, um, the various letters. There aren't any, there are people alive who remember those events. Um, there's a one woman in town, um, but I haven't been able to speak to her and she's already in her nineties and I'm not sure how mm -hmm. practical it's gonna be. Um, she, was, she was a great help to him, but I don't think, I'm not going to ask to visit somebody of that age and put her at risk. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing at least that those resources are available. They, they are, but it doesn't say the women, for example, are never identified. Um, yeah. But you can see the letters that the doctors wrote, for example, um, letters that Aiken wrote to his teachers, many of them very poignant, begging for assistance. Mm, okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we have also a raised hand from John. Is that how you pronounce his name? Sorry. Yes, thank you. That's a very fine pronunciation. Uh, thank you very much, Selin, for a very, very interesting presentation. And um, of course, you're the perfect one to write the history of, of Diamond Sangha, which itself is a very interesting story in the uh, transcultural history of, of Buddhism. You mentioned the, the, the focus on diversity and hybridity. Um, which also, of course, might be representative for this particular group. But also these ideals, there's this sometimes also an, an inbuilt uh, dilemma uh, talking about diversity and uh, hybridity. Uh, you mentioned um, Aitken's focus on calling his kind of Buddhism religion, and on the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, referring to people who would definitely did not call it uh, religion. And there will be all sorts of diversities in viewpoints also. Mm -hmm. uh, another diversity thing which could be a barrier is also ethnicity. Um, traditionally, I, would, I know that most uh, descendants of, of Japanese American uh, migrants do not have not participated in this group and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So how is the diversity now and and how would you think of it in the future? I mean, is it a uh, an inherent diversity? Um, Are, do you mean ethnic diversity in the local group, for example? Because mm -hmm. the original Cocoaan community was a third Japanese American um, in the 60s. Um, um, things changed when they went to Maui. Is, is that what you mean? Yeah, um, it did change um, because they did outreach on Maui to the hippie community over at the banana patch. And, and that was a very white crowd, uh, very mostly Euro-American. Um, and so Maui Zendo, for example, it, Maui Island um, is uh, different than Oahu, for example. Oahu is only about 18% um, Euro-American, um, whereas Maui is, is a much higher percentage. So the, the different Diamond Sanghas, even on the islands, look different. Um, Honolulu Diamond Sangha, um, the group I know, um, it is largely Euro-American, uh, but there are many people that we locally would call Hapa. Um, I'm not always sure. Hapa means mix. I, I, I um, yeah. Um, so uh, it's still a significant percentage. Um, and there are um, several Latinos uh, as well who are in that Sangha. Um, I've never, I don't, I don't know the Maui group at all. You, you studied, you looked at the Maui group, yes? Did you visit the Honolulu group? Oh, yes, yes. And I, I did see the diversity also there in, in, in many different ways. Yeah. yeah. And it depends on any given day who's there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question from Derek. Would Derek like to unmute and ask you a question? Or would you prefer I read your question, Derek?
Okay, I'll read your question, Derek. So, Helen, how important were Edkin Roshi's books on Zen in the development of the Diamond Sangha? I'd say they were pretty critical. Mm -hmm. um, many people who come to Zen come to Zen, um, well, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, from books. And Aiken was publishing and his books were popular. And people came to Hawaii. They wrote to him first. Um, I wrote a book about that, his distant correspondence, people who wrote to him. Um, and some of them came to Hawaii to join Diamond Sangha. Um, but uh, the books were critical. So he sort of had the people who were close um, the, the people on Oahu, the people on Maui, uh, sort of the close uh, group of practitioners that he knew well, um, there were the, the broader group within Diamond Sangha of people far, at far flung places that he knew. And then there were the people who read his books um, are sort of like the, this broad group of um, sympathizers, maybe you would call them. Um, but some of them became members. Uh, but he, he kept up co correspondence with literally hundreds of them. Yeah. So the books were really important and they did bring people in. Yeah. Lovely. Yes. Are there any questions? Any more questions from the audience? You could just um, unmute if you wish to ask or comment. going? Oh, there's something in. A question for the audience from Michelle. I'd be fascinated to know oh. how many people joining today have encountered Aitken. Yes, I did a few times in his visits to Australia in the 1990s. Yes, it would be nice to know. So everybody, if you, if you do this, there is a function. Let me see. Reactions? Yes, under reactions, maybe you could, if you have, you can just maybe put a thumbs up or some or a, or a raise hand. Yeah. So we know how many? Oh, I see at least one. Six at the moment. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, keep counting. <laughs> oh, well, seven uh, when it was the maximum number. Okay. Because the raised hands do disappear. Uh, I mean, the, the clapping does disappear. I know. Yeah. That's good. Yes, indeed. I agree with James. This is an interesting question. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. That's like a nice poll. So, Derek, is that a raised hand for another question or is that just your poll? <laughs> answer to the poll. If it is an answer to the poll, you can just unraise your hand. Just click on it again. Otherwise, you're welcome to ask your question, Derek. I guess not. All right, then. Yes, Jonathan, you have a question. Uh, yes, yeah, just a question. I found that very interesting, and I've been interested in Robert Aitken for, for decades. Can you just say a few words? What, what sort of a man was he? What were his drives, his interests, his passions? Uh, did he have a, a profession? Um, how was he regarded in the broader Zen community and so forth? Um, the, in the broader Zen, I'll start sort of at the end. Um, in the broader Zen community in the United States, he's thought of as, um, I've heard him called the dean of, of the, Zen, uh, the Zen community. Um, he was a very, what was he like? Um, uh, he could come across as very stern. Um, he certainly could assume the teacher posture without trouble, um, but he also loved to laugh. Um, his profession, he wanted to be able to do something that would allow for him to continue his practice as much as possible. So he worked for the university in a variety of capacities. Um, he'd done a master's degree in Japanese literature. Um, his undergraduate degree had been in English literature. He was very passionate about literature and poetry, um, wrote poetry throughout his life, um, took uh, words and letters very seriously. He wrote, um, he wrote letters um, often, um, he wrote books. 
Um, so he was a, a man of words, a man of the written word, I would say very much. I'm trying to think what else you were asking that I could mention about him. Um, yeah, he worked at somebody's put in, somebody met him at East West Center where mm -hmm. he gave talks. He worked for East West Center. He mm -hmm. started working for East West Center the year it opened, the very first year it opened. Um, um, he always spoke of having worked for the University of Hawaii, um, but East West Center is somewhat independent. So he worked throughout Asia and he traveled throughout Asia for that job, which he loved. Um, yeah, his master's thesis was about basho. So he was wow. fascinated with, with haiku. Yeah. yeah, with haiku, wow. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I, I just wondered, uh, he, he seems to have even now a degree of charisma, um, but I, I never know what the char charisma is in a Zen sense and um, what quality he would have to attract people and to inspire them and to uh, raise their interest. Well, it's funny that you use the word charisma. Um, when I met him, I thought that there were clearly moments when he was charismatic because I met him when he was older and he was very comfortable, you might say, in his own skin. Um, but I can tell you that he was socially very awkward all of his life <laughs> and that Ann Aiken, his wife, balanced that for him. Um, uh, I mean, he was very self-aware of this awkwardness and he worked on it. But working on it doesn't mean that it was natural. And it was never natural for him. Uh, whereas Anne was apparently, I didn't know Anne at all well. I, I mean, I saw her, but I never really dealt with her. But she was warm, um, where, where um, Bob could come off as cold and distant sometimes, um, usually because he was uncomfortable. Uh, Anne was warm and welcoming. So they worked as a team in that way very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think Dorji has, has a question. <clears throat> thank you, Venerable. Um, it's, uh, it's a question, I think it's not really related to the to this topic, but uh, I just want to know if the, the Buddhism in the Pacific Research Network is mainly with the scholars and the academic uh, collaboration, but also I didn't see that uh, some of these academic uh, and the researchers are from the Buddhist centers. You know, they have like a Dharma centers. It, for instance, like uh, Fugong Shang Venerable Jovi has. Uh, I mean, she's from the Dharma institution, Dharma center, and then like the, the Diamond Sangha in Hawaii. So are there like collaborations between these uh, the specifically with the, the, these uh, the Dharma centers and institutions in this specific region? not just the, the, the researchers. Thank you. Thanks, Dorji, for that. Is Anna, is Anna available to answer this question? Uh, yes, I'm here. I'm just gonna keep my video off because I'm in a remote location and my internet today has been a bit dodgy. <laughs> um, so thank you, Helen, and thank you, Vanuatu Wei, and Thank you for the question too. Um, certainly in Australia, we have been partnering for a long time now with uh, the Federation of Australian Buddhist Councils and also the Buddhist Council of Victoria because I'm based in Melbourne and also the Buddhist Council of New South Wales and Queensland and WA. Um, so, yes, we've been working very closely with communities especially the work we did on the Buddhist life stories of Australia, uh, where we were collecting oral histories. So, yes, those um, relationships are very well established. And it's certainly the communities who are informing some of our research questions and also research priorities. Um, so I, that's, I can speak for my own team. Perhaps Helen um, can speak. She's spoken a little bit already with her um, involvement with the Diamond Sangha, but Venerable Lecce could also speak and, and Venerable Jue as well. Thank you. Oh, and Sally Makara is here, I think, too. And yeah. I know that Sally and Mark also have been partnering, I think, with some Buddhist communities as well in New Zealand. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see. Who would like to speak next? Mm -hmm. 
I might add a, a yes, few venerable. remarks, uh, remembrances, actually. Um, I think that Roshi Aiken was very humble mm -hmm. and he was very folksy. He never put on airs. There was no pretense about him. He was just uh, very human and um, he never seemed to assert his, he never wanted to assert his authority over others. Um, another point is that he was really a social activist. He was at the peace marches. He was a very active um, I mean, peace activist. And he gave us all a sense that it was okay to be Buddhist and political. Because until that time, it was believed that if you were a Buddhist, you should not get involved in politics. And many people still follow this line. But Roshi Aiken was very clear that um, one could be a Buddhist and also be a, so a social activist. Um, for one example, he also worked to get uh, Buddhist practice into the prisons. And uh, it took him seven years to get permission to go into the white prisons. Um, there was a lot of resistance among certain religious practitioners, uh, but he didn't give up. He refused to give up. And he just kept at it until finally we were able to go in to the prisons. Uh, one last remembrance I'd like to share was the last time I saw him, um, he was already quite old and um, not in good health. But I took a friend who had been depressed her whole life. And she asked him, you know, how do you get over um, this sense of um, sadness about the world? He said, just get rid of the self. That's all you have to do. Just get over the self. And it was such a peak moment. It was so brilliant. He cut through it all. Uh, so I, I always appreciate it. I think of it often. His, the last words um, that I heard from him. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I want to thank Helen too for all the great research you're doing. This is really great that you're bringing this all out. Thank it, you. It's been many years and it'll be many more years, I'm afraid. Um, yes. And we've got Sally's response also in the chat that says that um, she worked. I think Mark and Sally together work through the uh, New Zealand Buddhist Council. Um, and here in Wollongong, here in Fokwangshan, I believe what we are doing is that we are part of this network because we feel that this network is an opportunity for all of us to bring together, I think, little known research about what's happening in Buddhism around um, the Pacific, a, a lot of right a lot of research, I think, is around Buddhism in Europe, Buddhism in America, and even Buddhism in Asia. And here's an opportunity for us to let the world know about what's happening in Hawaii, in New Zealand, in Australia, and what we hope later, also the Pacific Islands. Yeah. So if anyone would like to contribute towards the study of Buddhism in Australia, we welcome you to join us. Let me just get there. Oh, uh, yes. There is a question from Sally. Sally, would you like to unmute to ask? Or would you prefer to read it, Sally? Oh, yes, there you are. Sorry, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here with it. That was that, that question partly came from him. <laughs> um, we're, we're interested in, um, because of uh, in, in the Zen Centre that I'm part of here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, we're doing our best to sort of learn more about uh, our Zen Centre in relation to Māori history in Aotearoa and colonisation and stuff. We're engaging in various ways, like had our four vowels translated into Te Reo Māori, and, and we're learning how to pronounce that correctly and, and chant that, and various other things, because there's been a, you know, such a lot of ignorance in white culture in New Zealand about Māori culture, and although some of us have, have you know, tried to engage it, it's, it's a long, there's still a big kind of gap. So I'm just curious to know about the Diamond Sangha and if there are people 
in Hawaii engaging in that way with Indigenous culture in Hawaii or elsewhere as well? Some of, I, you know, since Aiken Roshi has died, I'm not sure. Um, in the early period, there were uh, Native Hawaiians who were part of the group. Um, some of the, some of the kupuna, um, some of the women who were members were, one of the women in particular was an important kupuna, uh, an important elder. Um, and Aiken had a really close friend uh, when he was on, when he was, when he was uh, a construction worker, um, when he was a contract worker on Midway and Guam, um, he was there with a man who was part of the Hawaiian Renaissance, uh, a native Hawaiian. But, um, but that person left the islands and then came back and they remained friends. I don't know what the relationship was afterwards. Um, and I don't know of Diamond Sangha becoming involved uh, very often. I know that when they've needed to do healing rituals, um, meaning when there are disagreements in the group, uh, that they have called in Hawaiian healers uh, to, to make things pono, to make things um, right and balanced again. Um, and so that they use, uh, I'm, I'm I'm blanking on, it's very late here. I'm blanking <laughs> on the Hawaiian word um, for the reconciliation service, but they do, use, um, they do use Hawaiian counselors to come in when there are disagreements in the, serious disagreements in the group. Um, but that's the most I can say that I know of that has gone on. Um, other than that there were members early on who were of Hawaiian and, and that many of Aiken's friends um, were part of the active Hawaiian community. They did not join. Um, the, the, those friends of his did not join. They weren't part of Diamond Sangha. Thank you so oh, much. My, what, my, one of my former yes. students says, ho'oponopono, um, making things right again, making things balanced again is the, is the practice. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, it is, it is very late for Helen, so I'd like to just, and I promised her that if there are a few questions, we can let her go to bed early. <laughs> Great, Damika, I'm, I'm sorry, we will, if you don't mind, we will close at this point. I'd like to thank Professor Helen Baroni and to everyone for such active participation and sharing next month on Thursday, October the 21st at 4 p.m., We will travel across the Pacific to New Zealand. Dr. Sally Makara and Professor Mark Mullins from the University of Auckland will present Buddhism in, now I'm trying to read this right, Ayo Aotearoa, <laughs> New Zealand, multiple sources and diverse forms. Also, the Nantian Institute will organize an international symposium on humanistic Buddhism where over 30 speakers will co-create a more humanistic future together with the audience. So please join us over the first weekend of November. Xiaoyang will put their website address in the chat for you to check it out and register. We know that many of you live in different time zones and hands appreciate very much your sacrifices to attend this webinar. All video recordings will be made available on the Nantian Institute website and the Shingen Education Foundation YouTube channel. And the links will be posted to everyone who register. So by working together, we hope to bring richer and deeper insights into the development and flows of Buddhism in the Pacific region. We continue to welcome expressions of interest in joining this research network. So please email our admin team at buddhism underscore network at nantian.edu.au with a brief note on your research area of interest and background. So till we meet again next month, updates on the webinar series can be found on our event website and may the merits of today's session be dedicated to the safety of all and peace in the world. Thank you all, please keep safe.